speaker on the cover of Wired, and it says, How to Be a Geek Dad. <laughs> Sarah Lawrence doesn't always select an alumni speaker at commencement. For example, last year's speaker, Arianna Huffington, wasn't one. Although alums Juliana Margulies and Rahm Emanuel were our commencement speakers for two years prior. This year's commencement speaker, renowned TV host of Myth Mythbusters, Adam Savage, is not an alumnus either, but I think of him that way. As John Hill said, Adam's career seems so to closely parallel the careers of so many Sarah Lawrence graduates in their invention and reinvention, mastery of disparate crafts and skills, and cognitive flexibility. I suppose one could argue that many of our alums also qualify as mythbusters in their own way too. The similarities between our speaker's life and the lives of so many SLC grads I know are so striking, in fact, that when I read his bio, I asked our alumni relations office to double check and make sure he did not attend SLC. But no, they told me, Adam spent six months at NYU's Tisch School of the Arts and then decided to leave. I said to Adam before that I was pretty certain had he instead chosen Sarah Lawrence, he'd now have a BA hanging on his wall. <laughs> In any event, while we can't give Adam official alumni status, I'm hereby granting him, by executive decree, unofficial alumni status. <laughs> and Adam, that means you're invited to reunion next month and allowed to make big gifts to the college. <laughs> For the few of you unfamiliar with Mythbusters, and therefore our speaker's background, Adam Whitney Savage was born in New York in 1967, grew up close by in the Westchester County village of Sleepy Hollow. It appears his creative streak was formed right in the cradle, as his father was a painter, filmmaker, and animator known for his work on Sesame Street, and his mother was a psychotherapist, certainly a creative calling in its own right. Adam's sister is also an artist, so it's truly a family affair. As a child and teen actor, Adam voiced animated characters in Sesame Street and appeared as Mr. Whipple's stock boy in a Charmin commercial and as a drowning man saved by a lifeguard in Billy Joel's 1985 music video, You're Only Human. <laughs> But the joys of acting were soon surpassed by those of hands-on envisioning, creating, and doing. With gigs ranging from being in special effects at George Lucas's Industrial Light and Magic, to graphic design, animation, carpentering, welding, electronics, teaching in the industrial design department at San Francisco's Academy of Art University, set design, fine art painting and sculpting, robot building, toy design, costume making, film and stage special effects, and model making for upward of 150 TV commercials and film productions. By the time he was asked by Jamie Heineman, now his co-host, to participate in a casting video for Mythbusters pilot in 2003, Adam had clearly already had multiple careers none of which, though, would provide the worldwide recognition and regard engendered by Mythbusters. Now, in its ninth season, this Discovery Channel show is seen by over 10 million viewers worldwide each week. Adam has guest edited and appeared on the cover of Popular Science and Wired, has been named an honorary member of Sigma Chi, the Scientific Research Society, and received an Outstanding Lifetime Achievement Award in Cultural Humanism from the Harvard Secular Society. With its tradition, tradition to have a carafe of water for our speaker, today we have to offer something more appropriate for Adam. So should you get thirsty, please enjoy, I have my props here, a liter of Coke and a tin of Mentos. <laughs> Graduates, parents, and families, faculty.
faculty, staff, students, and friends, it gives me great pleasure to introduce today's commencement speaker, the gifted, creative, and Sarah Lawrencean in spirit, polymath, Adam Sapp. Chairman Hill, Board of Trustees, faculty and staff of Sarah Lawrence College. I am humbled and honored that you would have me here to participate in this august and amazing occasion. To the graduating of the class of 2012, I say congratulations. <laughs> to your friends and family, brothers and sisters, and most importantly, your parents, I also offer my heartfelt congratulations. Well done, everyone. You must be very proud. My mom is right over there. She's very proud of me right now. <laughs> I'm, I'm old and I didn't print this big enough, so you're going to have to see it. I, I have to admit, I found the process of writing this commencement address a bit daunting. I was hoping to string together a few thoughts about what awaits you in the wider world when the real and unassailable truth is that no one knows anything. <laughs> and real advice is what you paid for it. Well, clearly you paid for this advice. <laughs> or someone did. <laughs> and then I came across a rhetorical flourish that I really liked. I thought I would juxtapose the moment in time when you guys were all coming into the world with the time that I was being formed by it. So I excitedly began looking up and researching movies and books that came out about this time uh, that were really important to me and the culture around me. Movies like that shaped my young mind, like Blade Runner, Raise of the Lost Ark, Empire Strikes Back, writers like Stephen King, Harlan Ellison, Kurt Vonnegut. And then I realized that I was thinking about the year 1980 when I was 13 and growing up a few miles away in North Terrytown, and it dawned on me that none of you were born until 1990. <laughs> then I felt old and I couldn't write anything for a few days. I started to imagine what I, a college dropout, might have to say to a large gathering of precisely the opposite. <laughs> Why I was invited to be here. I don't even know what I want to be when I grow up. <laughs> this is the first cruel question, right, that adults ask children. What do you want to be when you grow up? It's a lot of pressure to specialize so early. <laughs> and of course, we're at Sarah Lawrence, famous as a liberal arts college, both in name and politics. I heard you have a Republican here. Congratulations. <laughs> I'd suggest another term for the educational philosophy here, a foundational education, a foundation, a broad base, a platform from which to launch an idea, a building, a movement, a way of thinking, a generational shift. As a generalist and a jack of all trades, I agree completely with this paradigm. The broadness of my interests gives me an excellent perspective to do what I do, and I would not have it any other way. I spent an inordinate amount of my 20s thinking the opposite, thinking that I was too unspecialized, too old to make a splash as a young man to be an enfant terrible. I decried and derided all of the skills that I had serially picked up, billiards, juggling, unicycling. None of this helped me meet girls. <laughs> Acting and sculpture, well, kind of. I never got excellent in any one of them. I got just good enough. What a waste of time was the way I thought about it. But I got over that. Two things happened. One, I learned that my incessant skill gathering gave me a distinct and unexpected benefit. The benefit of context. When you're an expert in one thing, your lens on the world is often limited to that of your field. This is, of course, is illuminating in important ways, but it can also be restricted. When solving a problem as a generalist, or to use a more arcane term, a polymath, I can compare the many fields that I've dabbled in, the techniques, their philosophies, the ways in which they alter the lens through which I see things, and I can gain a literal perspective on the problem that I'm solving. 
this turns out to be the exact reason for my success in both film special effects and eventually in Mythbusters. Steve Martin, in his autobiography, Born Standing Up, has a fantastic quote. He says he runs into someone at the beginning of his career and they tell him, you will eventually use everything you've ever learned. <laughs> this is entirely true. The other thing that happened to me is that I learned how to work hard. Like, bust my ass hard. <laughs> There's a f there are few things that will get you over your own crap than working really, really hard. <laughs> It's not complicated. All you have to do is listen. Listen to what you've been asked to do. Listen to what's going on around you. Learn how the piece of the project you're working on fits into the bigger picture. Learn how you fit in. Pay attention. When you genuinely understand how the big picture works, you start being able to anticipate changes, adapt your behavior, adapt your output. You do this and you will simply do your job better and you'll make the job of everyone around you easier. This is actually my one regret, that I did not know how to work hard until my mid-twenties and to truly bust my butt. People who are smart and who work hard are in fact so hard to find they stick out like sore thumbs. <laughs> Be one of them. What else can I tell you? What else can I tell you? Well, I've got a few things. You will, at some point, probably move back in with your parents. I'm sorry, it's true, it's cool, it's only temporary, but go easy on them. They don't know what to do with themselves now that you're gone, but that doesn't mean they want you back forever. Try and save some money while you're there. Be kind, be kind to everyone. I can't stress this enough. I say this every chance I get. Kindness will pay you back inestimable dividends. Don't believe me? I will wager at some point that you will have the opportunity to work for someone who used to be your assistant or hire someone who used to be your boss. Both have happened to me. Don't work for fools. It's not worth it. Getting paid less to work for people you like and love and believe in is so much better for you and your career in the long run. Stay obsessed. That thing you can't stop thinking about, keep indulging it. Obsession is the better part of success. You will be great at the things that you can't not do. Be willing to be wrong. I've heard a bunch of this today so far. Don't fight for your idea just because you want the credit. Fight for your idea because it's the right one. And if it's not, let it go and put your muscle behind the right one. Trust your instincts. Take yourself with a grain of salt. A really big grain of salt. Think about yourself at 17, five some odd years ago. Think about what you thought college would be like. What you expected yourself to be like. Now, look at yourself. I'm gonna hazard a guess that things didn't turn out like you thought they would. This process will repeat itself ad nauseum throughout your entire life. The sooner you realize it, the better it will be for all of you and all of us. We are never finished products. We are always works in progress. Finally, the friends around you now, these people, you were graduating with, who saw you and fell in with you while you were still molten, being forged in the crucible of emancipation. <laughs> These are some of the most intimate relationships you will ever have because nobody knows you like the people who know you right now. I'm sorry to tell you that you will hurt people that you love and that you will help people you detest. <laughs> this is called being a human, and it happens to everyone, whether you like it or not. Nobody escapes. Finally, finally, finally. I wrote finally twice. <laughs> I 
I was editing, apparently not well enough, on a red eye only four hours ago. <laughs> Finally, remember that you have plenty of time. F. Scott Fitzgerald, the writer of The Great Gatsby, one of our national treasures, a true giant of the literary world, wrote one of the silliest things anyone ever repeats. <laughs> He wrote the inane quote that there are no second acts in American lives, and this is insane. <laughs> if there's one thing that typifies the American experience, it's that reinvention and rebirth are intrinsic to it. There are not only second acts, there are third acts, fourth acts, finales, curtain calls. <laughs> Raymond Chandler did not write a single word of fiction until his 40s. Julia Child learned to cook at 40. Clint Eastwood directed his first film at 41. Don't be afraid to be a late bloomer repeatedly. <laughs> Remember, you have time to figure out what you want to do, who you need to be, and where you want to go. You have time to fail. You have time to mess up. You have time to try again. And when you mess that up, you still have time. <laughs> Just so long as you're willing to work hard. <laughs> so congratulations on successfully completing act one of your lives. There will be a brief intermission and some partying, and you'll get started on Act Two. Thank you very much.